Hello, my darlings. Welcome once again to another edition of This Week in Mormons. I am your wonderful, intrepid host, Jeff Openshaw. And I want to tell you before we get to things that this week's episode is brought to you by the University of Illinois Press. And if you want to buy the books we talk about today, go over there. We'll have a link on the website, thisweekinmormons.com, for this episode. And if you use the promo code MORMON30, that's capital M-O-R-M-O-N-3-0, you can get 30% off and free shipping, which is a pretty dang good deal. So uh, we hope you'll go over and do that, support the show, and support the wonderful authors who are deep into Mormon lore. Latter-day Saints have long been associated with conservative political movements, but that wasn't always the case. Uh, the 1950s and 60s represented a period of enormous social change, not just within American culture, but also within Mormon culture. And Ezra Taft Benson, who was both a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and for a period of time the Secretary of Agriculture under President Eisenhower, became very famous for his far-right political and social views. And he played a pivotal role in bringing a number of uh, members of the church with him. So today, we want to explore how Ezra Taft Benson did that, how crucial of a role he has played in Mormonism's shift to the right. And to do that, we're going to talk to Dr. Matt Harris. Matt Harris is a professor of history at Colorado State University, Pueblo. He received a BA and MA in history at BYU and his master's of philosophy and PhD, also in history at the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University. He's a scholar of religious studies with a special emphasis on Mormons and race, Mormon extremism, and Mormons and civil rights. His most recent publications include Thunder from the Right, Ezra Taft Benson in Mormonism and Politics, Watchmen on the Tower, Ezra Taft Benson, and the Making of the Mormon Right, which will be coming out next spring, and The Mormon Church and Blacks, a documentary history, which was published by uh, University of Illinois Press in 2015. He also has recent articles including Mormons and Lineage, the Complicated History of Blacks and Patriarchal Blessings, uh, Confronting and Condemning Hard Doctrine from 1978 to 2013, and perhaps my favorite that we'll get into a bit today, Utah is the last in the Union to recognize the Martin Luther King holiday by name. Mormons, Martin Luther King, and the quest for racial justice. He's also working on two books, The Long Awaited Day, Mormons, Blacks, and The Lifting of the Priesthood Ban, and Hubie Brown, Mormonism's Progressive Apostle. So, Dr. Matt Harris, thank you for joining us this week. Oh, it's a pleasure, Jeff. And Jared, oh, by the way, and Jared's here too. That's right, everyone. Jared Gillins. I'm, <laughs> I'm welcoming myself back since Jeff didn't welcome me. Well, we might do some stuff, you know, before or after. Who knows? We'll be fine. <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm excited by this. I've, I've been sort of building up for this interview for a while. Uh, having read the book, the, the, the primary driver for this interview is the book that's out now, uh, Thunder from the Right by Ezra Taft Benson, which I think is an amazing title. Matt, what was the, uh, did you help name that title? Or was that somebody else? <laughs> Actually, it was the uh, the title of one of the essays on uh, Mesut Taft Benson, the presidency, and the press, in consultation with me, said, "You know, can we co-op that title for the book?" And I said, "Sure." <laughs> so it wasn't my my idea. It was uh, another essayist, and then the the press thought it would be a clever title, so I agreed, and that's how we got it. And I should note, by the way, you are the editor. You've re you wrote a piece, you know, within the book. But you are the editor of the book. It's a series of essays, in this sense. It's not a, uh, a single work just by you. Yeah, that's correct. correct. I wrote um, I wrote the uh, the introduction, which talks about Benson's views on church and state, and I also wrote a lengthy yeah. essay on civil rights and Benson. Yeah. And whenever I hear, I can't tell you for months. Whenever I think of the title, I think of that old Bruce Springsteen song, you know, "Blinded by the Light," covered by Manfred. You know, "Blinded by the," anyway, you know. But I think I want to sing it, "Thunder from the Right." <laughs> like every time, my wife looks at me and she's like, "You're reading that book again?" And I'm like, "I can't help it; it's just in my head <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, all the time." I'm curious, Matt. With uh, I'm just uh, if you could briefly talk about how this project came about. Did you kind of put out a call for papers uh, based on some of the work that you were doing, or did, were you just aware of other scholars' work and decided, hey, this might be a good uh, theme to build a book around? Let's get these together. How'd that work out? Well, the, the, so I've been working on blacks and Mormons for geez, probably eight, nine, ten years now, and the, which resulted in a book that Jeff had mentioned a minute ago, "The Mormon Church and Blacks: A Documentary History." And uh, the second book I'm doing on the subject is is a monograph, just a concerted effort, look at the subject since 1945. So I'm, that's my next project that I'm doing now. 
So anyway, as I uh, was building up lengthy file research files over the years on civil rights and Latter-day Saints and all of that stuff, certainly Benson came into the story. And so I thought, this is interesting. I wonder if other people thought that had the same views as the civil rights movement as, as Elder Benson at the time. So anyway, so I started just putting stuff away, putting stuff away. And then I realized that just a tiny little part of the Benson and civil rights stuff made it into its to the first book in 2015. Mm-hmm. And I never could have ever imagined that it would result in two books on Benson. <laughs> mm-hmm. But anyway, the, the short answer to your question is, is that Mormon studies is a pretty small group. Everybody knows everybody, it seems like. Right. And so I certainly knew the people that I wanted to contribute based on their strengths and their scholarly expertise. For example, Brian Cannon at BYU does um, the American West. He does agriculture. So he was certainly a natural fit for the essay on Benson and Ag. Um, J.B. Haas, BYU Religion, did a piece on Benson's presidency. And J.B. did a great book that was published a while back called The Mormon Image in the American Mind, which deals with contemporary Mormon history. So anyway, that's really how it came about, just me matching up um, bents into people's interests. And so I'm pleased that I got a pretty good wide range of voices in the book based on their past writings and also their scholarly expertise. Nice. Yeah, it was really interesting. So uh, broadly speaking, then, is by like kind of way of introduction for the subject matter, for those who are not familiar with it, mm-hmm. um, like how did Ezra Taft Benson fundamentally change uh, conservatism within Mormonism or, or lurch the church toward the right? And why was he controversial? We can get more into detail, but paint the high-level view of that. Oh, boy. Yeah. Well, yeah. Big question. Yeah, easy question. Big question. So, well, the, the context, the short, I'll try to be brief. The, the short context, and then we can dive into more details. But the short answer is that the church used to be, during the New Deal, Utahns had received a lot of um, federal assistance from the government. And in order to answer your question, I think you have to start with the New Deal. J. Reuben Clark, who was the most powerful man in the first presidency at the time, he was the de facto president for at least two of the presidencies that he was in. Not so much with David O. McKay, but with Heber J. Grant and George Albert Smith, because of their, their frailing health. Uh, J. Reuben Clark was running the church, much as Gordon Hinckley would in the early 80s with Spencer Kimball and, and, and his counselors who were under uh, had bad health. Anyway, uh, J. Reuben Clark was a, was a mentor to Benson and was extremely conservative. And Reuben Clark, along with, um, who was a Republican, and then Heber Grant, who was a conservative Democrat, they hated the New Deal. They thought that, that uh, people, not just Latter-day Saints, but people in general, citizens in general, were becoming too dependent upon its programs. And just to remind your your viewers, some of whom might not be from the United States, um, in the 1930s, the country was going through a Great Depression. And so Americans were looking to their government for help and paying their bills and putting food on their tables. Well, this is the genesis of the church welfare program that Reuben Clark creates, and, and apostles like Ezra Taft Benson are supportive of it. So they want the Americans, including Latter-day Saints, to get off the welfare programs of the government and to go to the church food house uh, storage house or bishop storehouse, as it's called. Anyway, um, and, and most Utahns, I think, I can't remember the, the statistics. It was like 70% of Utahns at the time were on some kind of uh, welfare assistance. So needless to say, they were big supporters of Franklin Roosevelt. The church leadership didn't like it. And and then um, Ezra Taft Benson, who was a junior apostle at the time, recognizes this also spent some time in Europe just after the Second World War. He's on a special humanitarian mission from the church to help out the saints who had been, uh, whose lives had been shattered by the war. So anyway, he attributes much of the suffering during World War II to these tyrannical governments, from fascism in Italy to you know, communism to socialism to whatever. Anyway, and he links the Franklin Roosevelt administration with those tyrannical governments in Europe. And even though most saints were supporting Democratic candidates in the 30s and into the 40s, it wasn't until the early 70s where you start to see this, this, uh, this electoral shift, if you will, among Latter-day Saints in the Intermountain West. And that's, I think, in the 72, 73, 74, somewhere in there, um, Latter-day Saints have supported Republicans and have never turned back. And you'll, you'll see some of that start to shift a little bit in the 60s with Lyndon Johnson. But certainly... Um, Ezra Taft Benson preaching against liberalism and government programs, and then before him, his mentor, Reuben Clark. Um, I think Reuben Clark and Benson certainly deserve much of the credit for this shift. So what, what drove them? I mean, what, what, uh, what is Ezra Taft Benson's background that made him so uniquely equipped to 
to be the one to see this over the line, to, to be so influential in this capacity compared to anybody else, any other apostles. I mean, I think Hubie Brown's the only famously more liberal apostle at the time, even if there was moderation, of course, within the ranks outside of that. But uh, why is Rataf Benson? What's, what made him so distinct? Well, I think, good question. So certainly growing up in the Intermountain West in Idaho, living up, growing up on a farm, most farmers tend to be conservative. So I think his own background has much to do with that. If you read Benson's writings, he talks about, he talks about, um, he's very proud of his pioneer ancestors, uh, some of whom were the first pioneers to come to Utah to settle in Idaho. And he talks about them not receiving any government assistance to, to establish the, the rugged uh, West. So, so his own personal experience is certainly part of that. Um, by the time he gets into government, the he's a moderate. I should tell you that he's a moderate in the 30s and 40s, moderate to conservative, we would say. He's supporting candidates like Dewey in 1948 in the election. He supports Nelson Rockefeller early on, who's very much a moderate Republican. And then when you get into the 1960s, you see this dramatic shift with Benson. He starts to move to the very, very far right fringes of the party. And we can get into you know uh, his views on civil rights and that sort in just a minute. But He'll adopt a whole range of views at the far right that most of his conservative brethren of the 12 don't support, and most of mainstream Republicans or mainstream conservatives in the 60s don't support either. So by the 60s, there's a shift that occurs with Benson, where he's no longer a, you know, this, this just conservative. He adopts some very radical views at the time. And, and you'll see this shift in 1961, the spring of 1961, when he comes back from Washington, D.C. and resumes his duties as an apostle. This is after he had served for two terms in Eisenhower's cabinet as the Ag Secretary. And the shift in the spring of 1961 occurs when he meets um, a guy named Robert Welch, who's founded this very controversial anti-communist organization called the John Burt Society. And the Burt Society just absolutely rocks Benson's world, gives him a whole new paradigm by which to view government, by which to view government assistance, the civil rights movement, all kinds of things. And the, the Burt Society is... Um, there's a lengthy FBI file um, that J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI okay. director, creates on them. And Hoover, by the way, is very conservative himself. But he he calls the uh, Robert Welch and the in the Birch people the most extreme right wing organization in the country. Well, so yeah, so Benson's very much involved with this and develops his very close friendship with the Birch founder, a guy named Robert Welch. Tries to get Benson to, or Welch to speak in general conference. Tries to get him to to speak at BYU. Tries to get him an honorary doctorate at BYU in the late '60s. So he he certainly is pushing the Birch agenda on the church membership. And he was, um, I mean, he was rebuffed in a lot of corners for doing this, even within his own ranks of the apostles, right? Because I believe he he was prohibited from actively being a member of the John Birch Society. Wasn't didn't they restrict him from actually joining, even though he was so? Yeah, the- it's kind of an interesting play out because President McKay, who's himself a, an anti ardent anti communist and also very conservative, and President McKay was fine with with Benson at least early on going to Burt Society meetings and being involved with the Burt Society. But what happened was is that when scores of Latter Day Saints write the first presidency letters saying, "Gosh, he just visited our Elder Benson just visited our state conference last week." And he's talking about how uh, corrupt John Kennedy is and Lyndon Johnson and the Supreme Court. They're all commies. I thought he's supposed to be talking about church affairs and the gospel. And so when President McKay and his counselors, Hugh Brown and Henry Moyle, start to read these letters, they're really upset by it. And so McKay pulls them aside and he says, look, you can still talk about anti-communism stuff, but you can't mention the Burt Society, nor can you speak at any more of their functions or their dinners or anything of the sort. And it, it creates kind of a confusion in the minds of Latter-day Saints because they can't distinguish when they hear Elder Benson speaking in general conference or, or at a BYU devotional or at a state conference. They can't discern the difference between the Burt Society or anything he says about anti-communism. So anytime he might, Elder Benson might say something about uh, anti-communism, most Latter-day Saints are just sort of assuming this is the Burt's line. And so he's in a precarious position because I think it's important to know why the Burt's people are so controversial, they're controversial even today, is because um, in 1958, Robert Welch, the founder, when he created the Burt Society, he created this lengthy uh, manuscript that was later published, I think three or four years later. But in 1958, he wrote this manuscript called The Politician, in which he argued that Dwight Eisenhower, you know, this five-star general was a commie. 
and that everybody within the cabinet was also had communist leanings, including, you know, oh, it's it's just really it's you can't yeah. make this was, stuff up. Was there any evidence to support that claim? Oh goodness, no, goodness, <laughs> no, no. This is a five star general. I think maybe a different question uh, would be um, when somebody calls a five star general a guy who's you know spent much of his adult life defending the institutions of the United States, and somehow some guy is calling him a commie and not just him, but his brother who was a close advisor, Milton Eisenhower. And also John Foster Dulles, the secretary of state, um, Alan Dulles, the head of the central intelligence agency. So most of the inner circle were, were communists. And um, according to Welch, according to Welch, thank you. <laughs> according to Welch. And so the more interesting question for me as a scholar was, I wonder if this ever got back to uh, Eisenhower. What did he think of his former agricultural secretary calling him a commie? And what did he say about that? Did they ever talk about it in private? Right. And the answer is to those questions, yes, 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 and yes. Oh. Yeah. So my, yeah. So um, the next book that will be published next spring that you referred to deals with all of those internal conversations. I don't think we talk a whole lot about it in this book because it just it wasn't relevant and it didn't come up. This book focuses on, Thunder on the Right focuses on other themes than the second book does, uh, which is called Watchmen on the Tower. But anyway, all those conversations will come out in Watchmen on the Tower. And it's it's really, um, Reed Benson becomes a member of the Jer- John Burt Society. He uh, becomes a regional director. And so he goes around the country as sort of a surrogate for his father talking about Eisenhower being a commie. And that stirs the pot even further and makes life difficult for Elder Benson, who's wow. adopted this worldview that the brethren are not happy about, by the way. You ask about you know, him being controversial. And there's a great story of Henry Moyle, who's a moderate Democrat. He's in the first presidency in the early 60s. I think he dies in 63. But anyway, um, great story of Henry Moyle going into Benson's office. And Benson, he called him Taft at the time. That was what some of his closest associates called him. And anyway, Moyle goes into uh, Taft's office and says, Taft, how could you do this? And he slams down a letter that Benson had sent out to the Quorum of the Twelve in the First Presidency, praising the politician as a book that they have they had to read. It's just so urgent that you read this book. And Moyle, who was a very outspoken man, um, certainly voiced his displeasure. And then Hugh Brown, of course was just to say that he was beside himself with Elder Benson was, that's an understatement. So, (laughs) I mean, you know, a lot of it depends on, I always tell people, you know, you have to understand people's circumstances. And I think that as a historian, you always want to contextualize people. And Elder Benson was not the first person to embrace the Birch Society. They had a sizable following. He was not the first person in the government or out of the government to embrace conspiracy views in the post-World War years. There were a lot of Cold War people who were struggling to make sense of communism with Russians and you know the nuclear buildup and all of that. So I don't think Elder Benson's unique in that respect. And you, you look at somebody like Hugh Brown, who was born in Salt Lake, but spent most of his formative years in Canada. He didn't grow up on a farm like Benson did. He wasn't Americanized like Benson. And he certainly didn't have the political proclivities that Benson had. And neither did the other brother, neither for that matter. You know, Harold Lee and Joseph Fielding Smith, certainly those guys are, if your viewers know anything about those apostles and church presidents, they were very conservative doctrinally and politically. But they weren't, they didn't embrace conspiracy. And they were among the harshest critics of Benson as well. Because Benson was, you know, anytime you're bringing in Latter day Saints are complaining about a high ranking church official, that's when certainly the brethren take notice. And when um, Joseph Fielding Smith and Harold Lee, they had read these complaints about the Burt Society and about you know all of that stuff. And so they, they also voiced his uh, displeasure about him being involved in politics and embracing a political message in what should have been you know, largely religious forms like General Conference and BYU devotionals. So, I mean, and this is mentioned in, the, uh, in one of the essays, but um, going on the, the, you know, how controversial Robert Welch and the John Birch Society are, you know, later it said that a lot of members of the John Birch Society ended up kind of feeling alienated because he ended up expanding this conspiracy theory into it being, you know, beyond communism, that there was sort of a global Illuminati that was pulling all the strings for both capitalists and um, communists. And it, I, I'm interested to know, I mean, I, it didn't really say in the book, you know, it said that while other 
members of the John Birch Society started pulling away at this point that Benson did not. Do we know what he thought of this extension of the original mission of the John Birch Society? Like, why wasn't he phased by Welch kind of going even more off the rails? Well, you know, Eisenhower writes some letters. You know, Ezra, how could you do this to me? I mean, it's pretty powerful stuff. And, you know, this this Welch guy, he's a crackpot. You know I'm not a commie. You've been with me for eight years. And, um, and, and the, 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 the genesis or the context of the letters that Ike wrote Benson was after, of course, their government service was over. And the genesis is when Reed Benson, in his capacity as the regional director of the Birch Society, was going around the country talking about a conspiracy within the government. Ike was a conspiracy or conspiracist, all that stuff. Or involved in the conspiracy, I should say. Anyway, that's it, the newspapers will cover it, and it gets back to Ike, and that's when Ike reaches out to Benson and says, "What's going on? What's your son doing?" And what's interesting is that um, all Elder Benson said was, "I'm I was misquoted." He says that his son misquoted him, or the journalist misquoted him. I'll get to the bottom of it. And what's interesting, he's unfortunately he's not misquoted because the about the within two days of him saying I was misquoted, I'll get to the bottom of it. Um, Elder Benson was writing J. Edgar Hoover a similar letter that that mirrored Reed Benson's speech in public, basically calling um, Ike a commie and trying to get the FBI director to support this. And, you know, I guess the bigger question is, why would somebody like, why would Americans in general believe in conspiracy theories in the post-war years? And why would somebody as accomplished as Elder Benson um, uh, be involved in this as well? And I just, just for your listeners, it's important to know who he is. He's not just the first Mormon apostle to serve more, ever to serve in a cabinet. This guy's also later on in his career, he'll win the highest award for, I think it's called the silver Buffalo award. If I remember that correctly, the highest second highest award or first highest civilian award that the boy Scouts offer. Mm-hmm. He'll also receive the presidential uh, citizens medal, which is the second highest award that the U S government um, offers. President George H W Bush in 1989 will bestow that on then president Benson, the church president. So anyway, he's not just, he's, he's a significant accomplished person. And the real question is, why would somebody like him embrace these, you know, seemingly crazy theories? And um, that's when you have to get a little bit into the literature, why people in general believe this stuff. And there's one line of thought that says that, that Americans embrace conspiracy theories because of a status anxiety. That's what one famous scholar wrote back in the 60s. They, they're just a little uneasy about their lives, their economic uh, situation. And um, that's what one scholar said. Another scholar said that um, they have these psychological issues. They don't feel good about themselves. They have a low self-esteem. This is what one scholar said. And uh, none of those fit Benson at all. He doesn't have a low self-esteem. He's a very confident person. I don't see him, not that I'm qualified to judge this, but I certainly don't see any instances of men- mental instability. He's a very clear thinker. He's well-liked. He's. I just don't see any of that. I think if you want to understand why um, Elder Benson latched on to Robert Welch so easily and uncritically, I might add, is you have to take him back to the Cold War. And Americans' lives were just so different when they thought that the Russians had this bomb that could destroy them. And so Benson tended to look, and I shouldn't just say this is not unique to Elder Benson. Um, Evangelical certainly felt this way as well. But the, the rise of the nuclear uh, nation, the Cold War, Cold War bunkers, the Red Scare at home, all of that stuff, um, people like Elder Benson and other evangelical preachers tended to look at it through a theological lens. But these were all signs of the times that would uh, portend the, you know, the winding up scene of the world. And so if you look at Elder Benson's writings during this Cold War era, he thought that uh, you know, all the conflict with communism and the proliferation of communism and the conflict with the uh, Russians was all were all signs of the times, and so that that's why I think he embraced some of these conspiracy um, ideas is because he thought that really that this was all something that would speak to Jesus coming again to reclaim his kingdom, and that's you know that's not an irrational thought for people of faith back in the fifties and sixties. It's actually quite common, and it wasn't just Elder Benson who believed that the Cold War manifested a sign of the time. Joseph Fielding Smith, the the church's most senior apostle in the fifties and sixties. Um, also believe that, but he didn't believe the conspiracy stuff that Elder Benson had uh, believed. Interesting. 
I want to talk about sort of the way the brethren carry out their work together back in the Benson era, maybe compared to uh, today. Like there's a part in one of the essays in the book mentions very clearly that Hubie Brown went out of his way. I forget which speech this was at President, that not President Benson, but Elder Benson gave somewhere. And there was such furor around it that Hubie Brown issued a statement and basically said, yeah, that's just Elder Benson speaking for himself, not for the church. Like a very public reprimand. Uh, in a sense, which you don't often see with public institutions, you know, stuff happens behind closed doors, but for what's public facing, you want to have kind of a united front. Um, do you feel like it was Benson's time in the church that really caused or taught the church to kind of tighten its grip on who says what and to whom in a public setting? Mm, that's a good question. Um, you know, the Brethren for a long time, I can't give you an exact date, but I can tell you the Brethren for a long time have had informal policies and review committees about the books that they write. And Mormon doctrine in 1958 certainly posed a challenge in that respect. Um, it didn't, certainly correlation didn't quite exist yet in those days, in the 1950s, but they still had some informal understandings that if you write some book that you need to say, you know, elder so-and-so, this is not, um, sponsored by the church, represents your own views. And then sometime in the 60s, maybe it was before that, I'm not sure, but sometime in the 60s, they start to tighten up on that. With um, with Elder Benson, I guess you have to understand that he, um, he gets a special blessing from David L. McKay, this beloved church president who's, who's, in, uh, who's the church president from 1953 to his death in 1970. He was called as an apostle in 1906. He's a handsome, charming man. He's a charismatic speech or, uh, speaker. The saints absolutely adore him. And if you speak to you know someone of an older generation, maybe in their seventies and eighties today, who who might have a memory of him, they will. It's just nothing but affection. Anyway, um, Elder Benson loved David O. and uh, President McKay loved Elder Benson. There was really a a close um, association there, and the. Uh, when Elder Benson, when he gave Elder Benson a, a special blessing in 1953 before he went to Washington to join Eisenhower's cabinet, um, in the blessing, President McKay promised Elder Benson or blessed him to watch and guard against communism. And he didn't say anything about liberalism or the Democratic Party. But what will happen is Ezra Tapp Benson will take that prophetic blessing and associate his need to guard against communism. Keep in mind, this is during the Joseph McCarthy era, too. He goes to Washington at the tail end of McCarthy. So that's the context. Anyway, uh, Benson will take those words by President McKay to guard against um, not just communism, but he links liberalism and any kind of government service or handout um, as part of this. And so that becomes his marching order for his entire ministry. And so what's interesting is that Elder Benson will um, give the sermons that he gives. Just He's just relentless. Every It seems like every general conference sermon in the late 50s all the way into the 60s is all about communism, big government, liberalism, all of that stuff. And you see uh, a dramatic change after McKay dies a little bit, at least through Joseph Fielding Smith and Harold Lee. Those guys are the first ones to start to rein him in. Because President McKay, who was sympathetic to many of his views and allowed him to, to talk about these things, even though he told him not to do the Birch Society thing anymore, um, Joseph Fielding and Harold Lee will rein him in a little bit. And then Elder Benson starts up again when Spencer Kimball becomes the church president in um, early 1974. And he and Spencer Kimball were called into the 12 the same day within, I think, you know, I don't know, 30, 40 minutes of each other. And President Kimball outranked him in church seniority just by a few minutes, really. <laughs> Anyway, so he felt like he had the, the gravitas or the, the right or, or maybe it was okay to resume his, his apostolic calling, if you will, um, when his friend Spencer Kimball resumed the presidency. And that's, that was the wrong assumption because President Kimball reigns him in pretty good too. We can talk about that more in just a minute. But anyway, to answer your question with Brown, so that's the context. President McKay allows him to do this. And when Hugh Brown, who's been pushing for civil rights for a long time, um, makes a statement in General Conference in the fall of 1963, he says, basically, he says at the beginning of his talk, um, well, let me back up. The, there was some, the NAACP, they were protesting, or they had threatened a protest conference. And Brown and N. Eldon Tanner, uh, Brown's cousin, Nathan Tanner, who was also in the first presidency, they met with the NAACP. 
and Brown being the um, the the compromiser asked the NAACP officials, you know, if we can produce a statement in general conference supporting civil rights, would you not protest? And they said, deal. So President Brown goes back to President McKay, who's now in failing health, and says to President McKay, hey, they won't protest if we can produce a statement um, in general conference. And McKay reluctantly agrees. Most of the brethren, McKay himself, including McKay, don't support civil rights at the time because of their fear of interracial marriage. If you break down these racial barriers in public, it'll lead to, you know, blacks and whites working together and working, dating and eventually marrying. So that was the fear. Anyway, um, so McKay said, you can give the, the, the talk in general conference as long as you don't, you just work it into your, your talk. And just kind of work it in, let them think it's your your thought, not the church's. And Brown, <laughs> being the clever guy that he is, ignores that counsel. And he begins his conference talk by saying, I have a statement I would like to read to you. And giving the impression that it comes from the first presidency. And then he pauses, now I would like to start my talk, essentially. So he ignores what President McKay wanted him to do because he wanted to give the impression that the first presidency was in support of civil rights. That was his own personal view, and he thought that that was the best for the church. Roger Taft Benson, at this time, is also giving public speeches about the civil rights movement being fomented by communists. So Elder Benson, as you can imagine, is not very happy that, that in general conference there's this public support for civil rights. And keep in mind, there, there's two aspects to civil rights. There's, there are state laws that are being bandied about in the Utah State Legislature in Salt Lake. Then, of course, there are national civil rights laws in uh, Washington, D.C. And so Brown didn't say his, his remarks were not in favor of any civil rights bill, either in Utah or in D.C. It was just a general statement saying the church supports civil rights. Well, anyway, uh, Elder Benson's not happy about this. And that's when he speaks to a reporter just days after President Brown gives that speech. And he says that he, he says what he says that, that you know I don't support civil rights. It's communistic. And then the reporter turned and asked Hugh Brown, "What do you think about what Elder Benson said?" There seems to be you know you guys seem to be at odds. And that's when President Brown says, "I speak for the church. He speaks for himself." Hmm. And so you see this conflict about what to do about racial equality. And if I can just uh, share something that you might find interesting. If you were to ask anybody in their 80s or 90s today who have a memory of Joseph Fielding Smith, they would probably tell you he was he and Bruce McConkie, his son-in-law, were the two biggest um, uh, supporters of the priesthood ban. They were the, the biggest hardliners, if you will. And what's interesting about Joseph Fielding um, Smith is that his views will evolve over time. And so by the latter last decade of his life, he seems to be more sympathetic to the plight of um, African-Americans and then persons with Black ancestry. And in the early 60s, 63, 64, just at the time that Lyndon B. Johnson is creating the Civil Rights Act that Congress would ultimately pass in 64, and then the Voting Rights Act in 65, Joseph Fielding Smith is one of the earliest apostles, along with Hugh Brown, who will go on record saying, we need to support civil rights, which is astonishing given some of his, his very um, pointed writings against black people in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Wow. Can you imagine anything like this happening today in the church. I'm sure they have differences, but um, I can't imagine anything like this happening now. Such public commentary. Well, you know, it was, it was pretty, it was brutal. I mean, let's, I mean, I, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It was um, <laughs> in general conference in the sixties, Hugh Brown gets up or Benson gave a, a conference speech and he talks about there are Judas's among us in church leadership. He's referring to Brown. <laughs> I mean, this was brutal. And after the conference, after the address, he doesn't mention Brown's name, of course. And probably, I'm going to speculate here for a moment, but probably, you know, a limited audience of people in Brown's inner circle and Benson's inner circle know the reference. There are Judases among us. But Brown certainly picked up on it because after the speech, Ernest Wilkinson, who was a very close friend of Ezra Taft Benson's, Wilkinson went over to President Brown and he said, uh, that, that was a great sermon, President Brown. Brown just looks at Wilkinson and he said, I don't think I'm going to be excommunicated anytime soon. Do you? And storms off. And because the, the reference of Judas is in church leadership, they should be cut off from the church. That was the implication that Elder Benson had made about President Brown. And anyway, 
and Elder Benson's own family, they talk about Brown being a burr under a saddle. That's the word they use. Um, but today, today you won't see that in church leadership, at least publicly. Certainly the brethren are human, if you understand you know, how they operate, how they think. They, they all have their own backgrounds. They have their own opinions. And certainly with some of the LBGTQ issues that have come out in the last few years, there is certainly not a consensus among the brethren with that. Um, but they do, they do recognize the need to be deliberate and discreet in their, in their um, private meetings. And so far, I haven't seen any breaches of that. In fact, I haven't seen breaches of that in quite a long time in church leadership. So kudos to them for keeping some of their disagreements under wrap. It's so interesting, though. I mean, there's that uh, in the Brian Cannon's essay, um, he talks about, uh, he gives an anecdote of a a member who didn't agree with uh, Elder Benson's USDA policies and saying, oh, you know, the, the person was worried that, oh, I'm, I'm in disagreement with an apostle. And it says uh, that Clark said, well, it's okay to be in dis- have a policy disagreement. And then the quote is, don't you know that church authorities do not always agree even on church doctrines? And I think that's so funny that like that was given as almost like a, like a reassurance, like we don't even agree on doctrine. And then, you know, as a modern church member, having grown up under, correlation and you know they go to such pains to present a united front like reading that made me think what <laughs> it's so uh, yeah it's just so strange to see uh, I, I don't think i have a question in here but, but um <laughs> so it's so odd to me that you know that they just kind of matter if they're very matter of fact about their disagreements and yeah like jeff said i just can't imagine a church today where we would get that kind of well blatant. matt hit on uh, oh sorry Jared. um Matt hit on one thing that was interesting to me. So LGBTQ issues are obviously something I think we're still navigating a lot as Latter-day Saints. I mean, I'm a native Californian. I was there during uh, good old Prop 8 and all that fun stuff. Uh, and I think we've changed a lot since then. But a good recent example is the um, the baptism ban, you know, for children of, mm-hmm. of gay couples. How that was instituted at one point and then repealed. And now for me, a lot of this is anecdotal, but many suggest that uh, people like then Elder Nelson, Elder Oaks were the drivers behind such a thing. And now it's very interesting that now that President Nelson runs the church and Elder Oaks is his number one, that they seem to be the drivers to repealing it. And I don't know if that's just me reading into it myself or if you have any insights into where the brethren might might fall on that issue in our modern day. Yeah, I have lots of insights about this. <laughs> Name names, Matt. Name them. <laughs> Off the record. <laughs> um, but I'll just give you some general thoughts. Um, it was uh, President Monson, the late President Monson, and certainly President Nelson, who was the senior member of the 12 at the time. And we can talk more details about this later. But um, so those two were concerned about a number of things that were going on the summer of night of 2015. You might recall the Obergefell decision with the Supreme yeah, court. Yeah. You might recall uh, that was in June of 15 when that came out. And then in July of 15, when the brother in her way on vacation, they take their vacations in July, typically uh, when they were away on vacation, that's when the boy scouts uh, came out with their new policy saying that they would allow, I think it was um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, gay scout leaders and so I think that, that was the upset first President Monson when he was away. That upset President Nelson. They had talked about the, as I understand it, they had talked about uh, the previous spring, this policy of not allowing the, the offspring or the children of uh, gay unions or gay couples to get baptized and to participate in the church. So that was talked about in the spring of 15. And then some of the apostles died. That kind of uh, slowed some things up. Anyway, so after the summer of 15, when there's some activity uh, going on, it's in September, as I understand it, when um, President Nelson and President Monson huddle together and they talk about the change and they eventually make the change. It creates, obviously, the New York Times picks up on it. A lot of people are blogging about it. They're upset about it. And um, there are anecdotes, as you probably know, or read online that hundreds of people are resigning their church memberships over this. And then uh, I'll end the story here in January of 2016. So this is just a few months after the policy came out in January, 2016, um, president Nelson, who's still a senior member of the 12, uh, he, I think he's acting president or he's no, he's president of the quorum of the 12 at the time. He gave a devotional address at BYU Hawaii and he likened the LBGT policy to the priesthood revelation of 1978, which is really interesting. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, he's elevating it to some kind of canonical status. 
But, I, you know, President Nelson, I'll, I'll tell you why, 95 years of age, um, the energy, the enthusiasm, he's moving, he's moving the boat. And for him to go back into, um, was it a month ago, two months ago, to reverse the policy after such a short period, it really, in my view, in my opinion, um, speaks to his energy, his willingness to change, to see the church go forward. I mean, that's just unheard of to make a, you know, such a incredible, important policy decision in November of 2015 and then just change it, what, two and a half years later. I mean, that's, that's extraordinary. And it shows that he's not willing to, to rest on the status quo. Yeah, it's so fascinating. Um, well, let's talk about, we talked about racial justice a bit. This is, this is in your wheelhouse. And you referenced before, of course, that uh, Ezra Taft Benson felt that the civil rights movement was a front for communism. And in particular, he had a lot of beef with Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, it seemed that he, he very much thought that, that MLK was some sort of a communist agent, despite no evidence, you know, in that regard. And MLK, I believe himself spoke out against communism. But nevertheless, Benson proceeded in that, in that vein for a very long time that even went as far, I believe, as having an effect on, as you mentioned in, in your paper, as far as Utah having a state law about not recognizing MLK Day as MLK Day. So I know I, I put a lot in there, but I mean, tell us about this, about Benson, Martin Luther King Jr., civil rights. Yeah. Well, again, I think it's important that when you write history, I'm a historian, I'm privileged to spend my days, my adult years thinking and writing about history. And it's always important to give context, because if you don't give context, it's just easy to misunderstand somebody. And Ezra Taft Benson is, will inherit this, this idea that King is a commie from the Birchers and also J, um, J. Edgar Hoover. So two men that whom he highly respects floats that idea in his head that the, these guys are commies. And I think it's important to know why Hoover and Welch thought that they were that Dr. King was aligned with commies. It's because two people in Dr. King's inner circle were once members of the Communist Party, and they'd been members of I think of the 30s and 40s. And what's interesting is J. Edgar Hoover knew that these two associates of Dr. King had were no longer active in the party when they were in Dr. King's inner circle. He knew that. He had wiretaps to that effect. He heard Dr. King on record saying, I hate commies, all of that stuff. And But yet, Dagger Hoover allowed people like Robert Welch and even Ezra Taft Benson to go around talking about this as if it were a fact, because he hated Dr. King and he hated the civil rights movement. He saw civil rights agitators as upsetting the status quo. They were bad for democracy. They were creating lawlessness and chaos with their sit-ins and endless marches. And so anything he could do, Jagger Hoover, to besmirch Dr. King's good name, that's what he tried to do. Anyway, so that's the context of Ezra Taft Benson um, believing that Dr. King was a communist and had communists within his inner circle. And later on in Dr. King's life, when um, just before his assassination, if, you, if you've studied Dr. King at all, you'll know that he has this radical transformation. Um, at least that's how I read his speeches and writings and, and some of the literature. Anyway, the radical transformation is he's no longer just giving, you know, sit-ins and peaceful, nonviolent marches. He's, he's, he's pushing for economic equality by the late 60s. He's certainly flirting with socialism. There's no doubt about it. And, um, and then that certainly fuels Elder Benson's views. And also his good friend, Cleon Skousen, who will take some of these views and just blow them up. And so what happens is, is that um, Ezra Taft Benson and Skousen, who's a very popular author, he's one of the most prominent anti-communist authors in the country in the late 50s and into the 60s, not just in Latter-day Saint circles, but across the nation. Skousen gave a talk, uh, a, um, a public forum in 1958 in front of 25,000 people in Hollywood, California. And uh, Ronald Reagan, Roy Rogers, and some other Hollywood anti-communists were also on the forum with him. So that's how big he was. And of course, um, Cleon Skousen wrote a book called The Naked Communist that President McKay had endorsed in General Conference in 1958. That's what put him on the map of Latter-day Saints. And also nationally, that's how he got to be on a national speaker circuit. So anyway, um, between Ezra Taft Benson and his good friend and neighbor in Utah, Cleon Skousen, they were... I'm um, giving talks and sermons all over the place talking about Dr. King being a communist. And so naturally, this sort of, you know, 
permeates and circulates throughout the church body. And uh, Mesertap Benson's writings are sold everywhere. And again, context is important with the rise of black power, with the rise of some other of the more aggressive elements of Black Panthers, you'll start to see Elder Benson's talks about communism and, and black people get more uh, vocal and, and shrill, if you will. So anyway, a lot of um, Latter-day Saints in the Intermountain West are picking up on this stuff. And this is what you see in the 1980s when, um, when it's the Martin Luther King National Holiday is proposed. And in 1986, when there's the first African-American uh, lawmaker, or maybe it was the second, I can't recall. But anyway, 1986, an African-American lawmaker in Utah proposed the national, the Martin Luther King holiday. And without going into all the details here, um, certainly he was shot down. They wouldn't even debate it or consider it at the time. Actually, it was 85 when he first proposed it. They wouldn't consider it at the time because they thought King was a communist, among other things. And he's very frustrated, this black lawmaker, um, because his colleagues, most of whom are Latter-day Saints, most of whom are white, they just don't understand Dr. King. They've been sort of fed this communist stuff. And they would never say it on the, on the House floor during the debates, they, but they would tell him in private, God, he's a commie. Why, don't you, why do you support him? And so anyway, um, over, so what they do is they decide to call it Human Rights Day. They, they just don't want to call it Dr. King Day. So they call it Human Rights Day, and the black community in Salt Lake, even though it's a small, but it's a very powerful and noteworthy community, they're upset by this because they want to honor the late, great uh, civil rights leader. So anyway, um, there are several lobbyists who get involved with this, and they start to work on some of these legislat legislators over time. And they also work the church angle. They recognize that um, Janetta Williams, who's still the president of the NAACP, um, she was one of the leading figures in all of this. She meets with, um, they invite President Hinckley to speak at their regional conference in April of 1998. And uh, this is really interesting and noteworthy because think about what, what most Latter-day Saints or what Elder Benson and, and um, Cleon Skousen had said about the NAACP back in the 60s. So King wasn't the only commie among them. The NAACP, they were also filled with communists. So anyway, um, so... Elder President Hinckley is now the church president, speaks at the NAACP regional gathering. And that's what opens the door for better race relations between the church and the, NAA, and the black community, to be honest. And so Janetta Williams um, is the one that brought President Hinckley to uh, this meeting. And uh, President Hinckley recognizes, why are we the last state to do this? This is, this is not right. And so he gives the word to the church lobbyist to act on the, chain, the name change. But there's a number of people, um, be nice to give President Hinckley all the credit for this, but there's several people working behind the scenes to make this happen. Um, and so by 2000, Utah becomes the last state in the union to change to the Human Rights Day to the Martin Luther King um, federal holiday. And uh, there were black activists involved. There are church people involved, both members, Latter-day Saints, some of whom I know personally. And then there are church leaders like President Hinckley. And they're all um, Larry H. Miller, Utah Jazz. There were other people involved um, coming to bear on the Utah legislature. And so um, it's really a remarkable thing if you look at how a lot of Latter-day Saints um, used to view the NAACP and the civil rights movement in the 60s and into the 70s. And by 2000, I'm not going to say that their views haven't changed, but the church is now supporting this very iconic leader in this national holiday. That's so interesting. And even now I've noticed since President Nelson assumed the uh, presidency of the church, he seems to be even more actively involved with the NAACP than in years past. I mean, he's been speaking at events. I, didn't, I don't feel like we saw a lot of him from President Monson, for example, but perhaps my memory fails me. Um, I've seen the outreach that we're doing with that group to be pretty conspicuous of late. And I know a lot of it's genealogy focused, but it's very interesting to see how we've come a long way with them. Well, President Monson, um, he, uh, he was certainly in frail health most of his church tenure. President in 2010, I think, what did he die in 2018? So he wasn't in good health. President Nelson, there's no doubt about it. He's opening the door for a better relationship. And in my opinion, he's certainly standing on the shoulders of his predecessor in the church presidency, Gordon Hinckley. I don't think that you would see the outreach today with the black community if it wasn't for um, President Hinckley's efforts. And I think President Nelson would probably agree to that. But there's certainly, they're trying to reach out to the black community. And, you know, a lot of um, people, 
whether they're progressive uh, Black Latter Day Saints or progressive White Latter Day Saints or our Hispanic brothers and sisters, doesn't matter. There are some people who argue that the church owes the Black community an apology for for the priesthood and temple ban and some other things. And you know, the church just doesn't get in the business of apologizing, as um, President Oak said a few years ago. He said, "We don't give apologies, nor do we seek them." And so, what I see is. Um, I see this as a sort of an apology, if you will, of of the church trying to move forward in a good faith effort to work with our black brothers and sisters. And I, this is how I see it anyway. And I think it's a good thing. It's interesting, um, you know, going back to then President Benson, because we see him very vocally, you know, anti Martin Luther King, anti civil rights movement. Um, but then, you know, he doesn't. Well, I mean, as far as we know, he never spoke publicly after. You know, official declaration two came out, but 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 I mean, ostensibly he must have supported it. So, but then on the other hand, you get um, you know him aligning himself with the likes of like Strom Thurmond and George Wallace. Like, it's hard to get like a clear picture of President Benson or Elder Benson's views on race because it seems to be coming mostly in his policy positions. Mm-hmm. And do we know much about? I mean, was he supportive of black people's rights outside of? you know, the, 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 the formal political movements that he was opposed to? Well, if we could just work backwards for a minute during his presidency that in, when president Benson became the president and he was ordained, I think in 19, in, let's see, January of 1985. Mm-hmm. Anyway, um, this is during the time that the national holiday was sweeping throughout the United States and Arizona, there was a massive, very vocal and high profile blow up when Evan Meekum, the governor of Arizona was sworn in. He's a Latter-day Saint guy. He's a close friend of Ezra Taft Benson. He's a close friend of Cleon Skousen. First thing he does as the governor of Arizona is to rescind the Martin Luther King holiday that the state had earlier announced, declared its support for. And when Governor Meekum did that, uh, you know, it just it, some of the saints in, in Arizona, especially Mesa, were just really angry. And then there were some old time saints there that thought that Meekum did a great job. They were, I know a couple of them actually, they were members of the Burt Society. So anyway, the New York Times picked up on this, the Washington Post. It created kind of a black eye, if you will, with President Benson starting out his presidency. And people are writing in, journalists are writing into the uh, church headquarters, you know, what is your, what's your, your, the church's stand on the Martin Luther King holiday? And anyway, it became really high and sort of vocal when some of the old letters or old writings of Ezra Taft Benson, so this would have been when he was an apostle in the 60s, when he was besmirching Dr. King as a commie and, you know, an adulterer and all of this stuff. Um, some of those letters were published in the Arizona newspapers in 86. So the church is trying to get away from this right-wing extremism. I think this is really important for your listeners to know. The church, by the 1980s, is trying to get away from um, not conservatism necessarily, but right-wing extremism. And that's what they viewed with the Burt Society and King and communism and all of that stuff. And so they weren't getting off to a very good start with um, this episode in Arizona that made the national you know, newspapers. And we don't have a good record of Elder Benson's racial views um, um, by the 1970s. Um, But he does support the priesthood revelation. There's no doubt about it. There's some good evidence to that. He supports it. And he'd been told by um, President Kimball that, you know, look, you just can't do this. Your racial views, I'm going to be, take my filter out just for a quick moment, but your racial views are not, it's not good for business. We, We can't missionize. We can't spread the gospel to every nation, kindred, and tongue. If you think that black people are, you know, aligned with communism, that's just not going to work out very well when we're trying to get into Africa. That was President Kimball's position. He also said that we can't denounce socialist governments as antichrist. That that hurts our missionary efforts in Northern Europe, many of these countries that love their socialism. So anyway, um, and President Kimball goes on record saying, you can be a communist and join this church. So there's some ideological differences between these two senior apostles, President Kimball, who's his ecclesiastical superior, and then Benson, of course, is the next in line. And so in my reading of the the evidence, Elder Benson hears President Kimball very clearly on this and recognizes that his public pronouncements by the late 1970s, he he just can't do this any longer. And in in the 1980s, um, 
I'll just finish. Your readers, your listeners might be curious about this. In 1980, this is the last time where President Benson gives a comment in public that uh, that's very controversial. It doesn't deal with race at all, but he gives a BYU devotional in February of 1980 in which he, it's called 14 Fundamentals in Following the Prophet. And oh, yeah. I yeah, remember that one. I know that. Yeah, yeah. I remember that. That one on my no. mission, I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, well, what you didn't know, I mean, when I was at BYU, <laughs> we, we, we studied this in the teachings of the Living Prophets class, and I think it's still in the church manuals, I think. I haven't checked the latest one. But anyway, um, he gives these 14 fundamentals, and, and a couple of the points are extremely controversial, one of which says that a living prophet is more important than a dead mm-hmm. one. And, and he, so that was one. The other one was the prophets can speak for God even in politics or civic affairs. Mm-hmm. And to the people who know Elder Benson's you know, long history of denouncing you know, Democrats and communists and socialists and liberals, they saw the writing on the wall that when he became the church president, he was going to move the church to the hard right. And, and also, Elder Benson had been talking about the church endorsing a political party just a few years before that. And so a lot of people really, really, uh, when I say people, I'm talking about BYU professors, I'm talking about people who knew his background, they complained to President Kimball. They just said, this is awful. The newspapers picked up on it too, of course. They recognize a good story when they hear it. So anyway, um, President Kimball is really, really upset. This is really, uh, Elder Benson's affecting his vision of this universalist gospel. And you guys may or may not have studied this, but 1974, um, President Kimball gave this incredible speech. Uh, he gave it to, I think it was a mission president seminar, a regional representative seminar, seminar, as they called it in those days. But anyway, he said that every member needs to lengthen their stride. And that became sort of a motto for his presidency, to lengthen your stride. And what he meant by that was, we need to do more about bringing the gospel um, internationally so that we can hasten the second coming. because Before Jesus comes again, we have to bring the gospel to these countries. Anyway, so that's the context of that. That is his ministry. That's what he's building his ministry up around, is the, the spread of the gospel around the world. And President Kimball knows that you can't do that if you can't get into Africa. That's another issue. That's one of the things that leads him to lift the ban. And secondly, if you've got this very outspoken and, and, and committed apostle who's talking about you know, socialists and communists being the Antichrist, and that black people who, who believe in civil rights are communists, that's just that's not good for the church. So anyway, Elder Benson, to his credit, listens to this and supports the revelation in 78, but yet still gives this controversial speech in February of 80 at BYU. The professors and other Concerned Latter-day Saints, they write in to President Kimball and also the First Presidency, express their grave displeasure of what they see as the writing on the wall that President Benson's going to move the church to the far right when he's the the president. Anyway, uh, Spencer W. Kimball calls Benson in, and he asks him about it in front of the entire Quorum of the Twelve. And it's, it's essentially rebuke, and he forces Elder Benson to apologize for that. And apparently, this is from Ed Kimball's, um, President Kimball's son's excellent biography called Lengthen Your Stride. There's a passage in the book where um, uh, President Kimball wasn't happy with Elder Benson's uh, apology. So a week later, he has Elder Benson come back. This time, all of the general authorities are invited, and he has to give a second apology to them. And this is really humiliating for this very proud and accomplished man. It really is. And it's the last time that, that um, he speaks publicly about politics. And um, if you follow his presidency, he, you know, a, a time or two, he'll talk about Gadiant and robbers and secret conspiracies. But really, they're just sort of offhand comments that he makes in various sermons. But for the most part, he focuses on other things that come to define his, his church presidency. Wow. Yeah, because I wondered about that. I mean, in my view, I feel like, yeah, he was, he's most famous as church president for his talk on pride and, of course, encouraging us to read the Book of Mormon. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that's that's sort of his legacy. And I always wondered, I love learning about this because I wonder more, like, what really caused him to button up about the other stuff when he was church president? In my view, I think the easy way to interpret it has always been, well, you know, it's uh, you change when you assume the mantle, right? You, you, you might fundamentally change and realize there's other bigger fish to fry, other things to do. But we also easily forget that one's own lived experience can also greatly affect (laughs) uh, how how an individual is going to go about uh, leadership when the time comes, even all the way at the level of being a prophet. 
Well, I think I think it's important. I want to be as fair as possible to yeah. to um, President Benson. I mean, that's I just think we owe that you know the golden rule. We want to treat others like we want to be treated. And you know, sometimes it's hard to know um, the motives for a shift. Does President Benson does he really have this ideological shift, or does he is he sort of by circumstances forced to shift? And I don't. There's not an ide- ideological shift with Benson. He, he's certainly forced to by circumstance. And um, President Hinckley's the person that really, uh, I guess, convinces him that President Kimball really deserves a lot of the credit. But President Hinckley is the one that sort of finishes it off. And because they're trying to build on President Kimball's legacy, and to President um, Benson's credit, I mean, he, the first general authority he calls is a black Brazilian. So, Havecchio Martin. So, let's be clear on that. He calls him. He also calls a Bircher into the first quorum that President Hinckley wasn't happy about, uh, a guy named Verlin Anderson. Hmm. So, it also, um, <laughs> I've had, I've given several talks to Latter day Saints around the country about President Benson and some of his views. And, you know, the, the old idea is that, oh, he changed. Well, you have to just nuance that a little bit. In the sense that he recognizes he cannot no longer, you know, talk publicly about conspiracies and the government's evil, and especially if you're trying to missionize to liberals and Democrats and people in Europe and all that. But the, I always tell people, you know, he's ordained the church president in November of 1985, as I recall. That's when about the time that President Kimball died. He's ordained in November of 85. In early January of 86, the first thing that one of the first things that Benson does is he uh, contacts the Birth Society and said, hey, can you guys, can you send me your literature to my counselors, Gordon Hinckley, Tom Monson, <laughs> and Arthur Haycock? And uh, <laughs> I've interviewed with the, the um, Birch president, who's now emeritus, who knew President Benson well and had visited him in Salt Lake. And um, he said something interesting to me. He said, um, I always got a chilly reception when I visited there. And he said, do you know anything about that? And I said, yeah, I think I do that some of the brethren just, they were moving away from right-wing extremism and they just didn't want, I mean, probably no offense to you, but they just didn't want somebody associated with the Birch Society visiting with President Benson. They wanted him to focus on other things in the church and not bring up, you know, fights that they had already fought, you know, 20, 30 years earlier. So clearly there's this ideological shift going on. And in 1992, um, uh, uh, General Authority, Second Quorum, member of the general authority a guy named Malcolm Jepson, his responsibility is, is Idaho, Utah, and I think parts of Arizona. Anyway, he goes around giving state conferences and he gives a whole long list of people. He says, if, if you're on my list, you're in trouble with the church, basically. I'm giving a crude paraphrase, but um, he said that these are people who are stockpiling weapons and you know years with the food storage, survivalists, and also those who are associated with the Burt Society. If you fall on this list, you're an apostasy. And this is interesting because of two reasons. Number one, President Benson's still alive, even though he's not communicating at this point. He's in such frail health. And then secondly, of course, a lower level general authority never would have done any of this stuff had he not had approvals from the higher ops. And so this would have been President Hinckley, of course. That's pretty funny, too, thinking about that with respect to another notable work of recent years, um, educated by Tara Westover. And so... Uh, just talking about denouncing fundamentalists in that capacity. And yet here we remain, you know, and, and I see it even today. I don't want to politicize this too much. A couple of weeks ago when the church came out and formally prohibited firearms in, mm-hmm. in meeting houses. Right. And, yeah. and I, I think it's so interesting, the things about which we are passionate as individuals. And I saw so much commentary from individuals who I would assume otherwise are pretty, you know, follow the prophet types, like the ones that will just say, you know, if the prophet said it, you follow it and, and you don't question things. And yet these same individuals are posting like, oh, they will take the gun out of my dead hands. Like I will have my gun at church. And I think it's so interesting how how much we sort of can be, well, selectively obedient for one thing, depending on what matters to us most. Um, but how even, you know, if the church comes out with very clear policies, we're still humans. <laughs> and even if we're labeled apostates for something, we might just still follow through on our own leanings one way or the other. Well, you know, you guys recall... The, I write about this in my second book. I talk about Tara Westover, her book, Educated, how uh, Benson and Skousen had influenced her, her father. Yeah. And also, um, I write about the Bundys. You guys recall a couple sure. of years ago, right? Of them too, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. So I've got some really good stuff there. 
Um, but the Bundys were, they were devotees of Benson and Skousen. And what's interesting is, and they are also very active practicing Orthodox Latter-day Saints. Right. And when they were appealing to the Book of Mormon to justify what they were doing, occupying this, this, these federal lands in Oregon, the church put out a statement saying, you know, we don't support this. And the Bundys were, they were just flummoxed. They thought that they were doing God's will. They thought that what they were doing was in line with church teachings. And what's interesting is people like them, these, these far right fringe types, what's interesting is that the church is moving away from that. And they, I guess they never got the tweet. They never, <laughs> I don't mean to be flippant, but they, they just, they didn't see the shifting winds. And President Hinckley is, is, but even someone like Elder Packer, who's very conservative, um, Elder Packer was very uh, vocal about politics, and he told just a quick story that your listeners might be interested to hear, that um, when he called Malcolm Jepson, uh, or when, when Malcolm Jepson, just before he was called into the Second Quorum of the Seventy in 1989, um, Boyd Packer, who was friends with Jepson, Jepson had, they'd grown up together in Brigham City, as I recall. And Malcolm Jepson was a physician by trade, and he was the personal doctor to Ezra Taft Benson and Flora Benson. So there was a connection there. Anyway, um, but Boyd Packer, the story goes, was driving in his car one day, and he felt that the spirit told him to stop his car and go see his friend Malcolm Jepson, who was then at work in his medical clinic. And so Packer goes in, lets the secretary, can you interrupt him? He's with a patient, can you interrupt him? And so that's what they did. They interrupted him, and Dr. Jepson came out, and he met with his old friend, Elder Packer. And Elder Packer basically said, the spirit has prompted me to tell you to not join the John Burt Society. And you'll know why soon enough. And Jepson assured him that he wasn't going to going to join the John Burt Society. Um, and it was like a week or two later where uh, he was Elder Jepson was called in as a general authority. And later, um, Jepson's family and they went on record saying that that we believe that if Dad would have joined the Burt Society, that it would have been a disqualifying factor in his oh. call to church leadership. Yeah. So the larger story here is the church is really, really trying to move away from right-wing extremism um, under President Hinckley's leadership. And even though most of the brethren are Republican, even though most of them are conservative, they're trying to stay conservative as opposed to embracing these, you know, radical ideologies that they think would hurt, um, you know, church, the church in the long haul around the world. Yeah, I noticed um, there were several times throughout the book where... Um the white horse prophecy is sort of alluded to. And, and if our listeners don't know what that is, that's the, this kind of spurious um, supposed prophecy that Joseph Smith gave that, uh, that the constitution would hang by a thread and the elders of the church would rise up to, to preserve the constitution in the latter days. Anyway, there, there's a lot of like sort of references to this. And I was like thinking about it and I was thinking, when was the last time I actually heard a modern member of the church talk about that? And I've, I even found recently a, a few years ago, the, the the Mormon newsroom or whatever we're calling it now, um, uh, church newsroom, church just, newsroom, just the church uh, newsroom, yeah, the church newsroom, um, issued a statement, uh, flat out denying that the White Horse prophecy is is genuine. So, do you think that's kind of along those same lines of the the church moving away from right wing uh, positions? Is that why they've also distanced themselves from things like the White Horse prophecy? Yeah, absolutely. You know, to go even further back in 1918, Joseph F. Smith, who was then the church president, he he said in conference that this is not doctrine, it's spurious. But yet, if you look at um, in the 1930s, the brethren are struggling. I mean, there's a world war, there's a Great Depression, and you'll see a number of apostles talk about the White Horse Prophecy in general conference. And in 1948, in a conference sermon, so Ezra Taft Benson's been an apostle for just a f four years at that point. It's the first time in 1948 where he utters the White Horse prophecy. And of all the brethren over the years, Ezra Taft Benson's the one that utters it the most. And by 2000, um, people are asking, you know, Orrin Hatch, when he thought about running for the presidency, are you the fulfillment of this prophecy? <laughs> And, you know, it's kind of embarrassing to think, right, if you're, you're running for national office, that you're the guy, right? And so yeah, he kinda, Orrin Hatch is going to be the one to, to deliver us, everybody. He's <laughs> Orrin, Orrin Hatch. <laughs> Who knew? Senator Hatch, the, the prophet Joseph Smith had Orrin Hatch in mind that would save the Constitution. But anyway, 
Um, so Orrin Hatch in 2000, and then you get um, Glenn Beck picks up on this theme. Beck joins the church in the 1980s, and his during the Bush years is when his program takes off. Yeah. Anyway, so he starts to talk about the White Horse Prophecy. And then in 2012, um, you get this Idaho, this, this uh, Latter-day Saint who's running for, I think, governor of Idaho in 2012. And he has these clo- a series of closed-door meetings with Latter-day Saints in which he talks about the White Horse Prophecy, which is odd because if it's a public um, position like running for the governor, you'd think that you would have meetings with everybody, not just Latter-day Saints under closed doors. Well, anyway, word gets out what this guy's doing, and it gets back to the church. Journalists, of course, will ask, hey, what do you guys think about this prophecy? And that's when the Mormon newsroom, as it was called at the time, that's when they released the statement saying, we don't support any of this stuff. And that was the first time, I think, in recent years where you see the church going on record saying, this is not church doctrine. Mm -hmm. But certainly it wasn't unprecedented because Joseph F. Smith had said it, you know, years earlier. It's funny because I, it's funny that I didn't know that Joseph was did you say Joseph F. Smith had said that. Yes, Cause, yes. Because I, I grew up in a household where my dad would like frequently reference that and, and sort of you know as this like we all need to be prepared. So it's so funny that uh, in spite of a church president coming out against it, that the members kind of a lot of them didn't get the memo and continued to uh, pass on a, a, this folk doctrine. I grew it's up with funny. it anyway. It's funny how we do that, right? It took a couple. <laughs> uh, how long did it take to get rid of polygamy? Uh, a couple, right. couple effort, couple tries there, I guess. And right. I mean, I'm a product of that. I'm a product of saints in Mexico flouting the oh. rules and still being polygamists. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for that. But uh, I think sometimes we take a long time to get the message. <laughs> to actually, okay. well, I think I think it speaks to the larger issue about how the church works. In my experience, writing and studying. Um, church history, it's the church will rarely make these, you know, loud, blaring statements that we no longer believe this. They just don't do that. What they do is they they meet with people as individuals. So if somebody else, if somebody's going around the church saying, Oh, I'm the I'm the guy that the prophet said that would save the constitution, then the church would issue a public relations statement that the Idaho newspapers, I think they're the only newspapers that publish the the statement. So they wanted people in Idaho to read it. They didn't see fit to, you know, publish in the Enzyme or somewhere else where a broader audience of Latter-day Saints around the world could see it. So they just kind of target the the problem rather than just making this, you know, broad statement. That's typically my experience, and it's probably a good policy to follow, I suppose. So you mentioned, of course, you know, Elder Benson, President Benson, helped kind of lurch the the body of the church to a more conservative place. I myself think we're still pretty much there as a church body. I mean, we've talked a lot about what the brethren are trying to do from an official level, and now we've talked about how it's hard to get that down at the working level in the church. Mm -hmm. Um, Why do you think that is so hard? Like, especially I feel like Latter-day Saints have a hard time separating their political views uh, from their religious ones, for example. I mean, especially like in 2012, I can't tell you how many people just assumed that we were all voting for Mitt Romney. Like, and, and Before if, we even working on his campaign, I remember somebody yeah. saying, what have you been doing for the Romney campaign? And I said, I'm not, I, I, I'm not doing anything for the Romney campaign. Why are you assuming this? And then if you tell them like, well, no, I'm not, I even said like, I'm not going to vote for Romney, I don't think. And people step back and say, what, are you serious? How could you not? He's not only a Republican, he's one of our own. You know, how could you not do this? Yeah. They asked Mitt Romney, a journalist asked Mitt Romney about the White Horse Prophecy too, and Romney just cleverly avoided the question, which is, you know, smart. Classic so, Romney too. That man, that man cla- wears many coats. You know, yeah, what he's cla- doing. <laughs> Classic Romney, classic politician. Well, I think, um, I, you know, Ezra Dab Benson certainly is the person responsible for, um, he gave a high profile interview in 1974 in which, this is to the Salt Lake Tribune, in which he said that you couldn't be a good Latter-day Saint and a good Democrat. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he had said that before behind closed doors, but this is the first time he had said it publicly. And you know, I'll tell you what: we Latter Day Saints are a loud and vocal lot because um, the Saints will a number of Saints will write into President Kimball in 1974. How could he say this? I read this in the Salt Lake Tribune, and this is the if you want to document. I think we've all heard this that he's that that's been said before. That that's where he says it. 1974 in uh, this Salt Lake Tribune interview. Anyway, so Latter-day Saints have sort of been, you know, inculcated with this idea that you can't be a Democrat and a Mormon. Certainly there are people who believe that today. And Ezra Tab Benson, I think, is, um, you know, certainly uh, enjoys a large responsibility for that. But also, too, that um, the American electorate is changing. I mean, Latter-day Saints are not comfortable with the Equal Rights Amendment. They're not comfortable with uh, the civil rights movement from the 60s. 
They're not comfortable with um, abortion, Roe v. Wade. So there are social issues out there in addition to President Benson that would um, push them into the Republican camp. And I will say that um, President Hinckley is worried about this idea that this is a one-party church. And by 19, I think 1998, um, President Hinckley asked uh, Marlon Jensen, who's a member of the First Quorum of the Seventy, to interview with the Salt Lake Tribune. So this is the same venue in which President Benson had said what he said 30 or 40 years earlier about being a Democrat and a Mormon. Anyway, so Elder Jensen interviewed with the Salt Lake Tribune, and he talked about the need to be have diversity in church politics, that this can't be a one-party church. And I think one of the reasons why he said that was not just because he was a Democrat. <laughs> I mean, he was chosen very se- selectively for this interview. It oh, yes. Good. Yes. They knew yeah. what they were doing. Yeah, well, they knew what they were doing. Absolutely. Anyway, um, but President uh, Hinckley and also Elder Jensen recognized that it was good for the church if they have diversity, because you can't, you know, if people think that you're just this right wing extremist church, it, it might be put offish, right? You might attract some other right wingers, but you certainly don't want just to, this to be a right wing church. And I think this is my opinion now. I'm going to just speculate for a moment. Um, my opinion is, is that they're looking at what's going on with the with evangelicals, Jerry Falwell, and this sort of grassroots organization that sweeps Reagan into power in 1980. And, you know, the, 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 the right wing, um, those guys, Reverend Falwell and his group, Ralph Reed, some of those people, they, uh, they give this idea that God that the Republican Party is God's own party. In fact, that's what one of them calls it. God's own party is the Republican Party. And so- G- GOP, yeah. The GOP, that's right. So so President Hinckley and Elder Jensen, I mean, they're, they're fearful about this because they don't think this is good for business. And if you look at today's politics, I mean, we haven't seen any other, as far as I, can, I know, we haven't seen any other expressions from the brethren today about you know, political diversity. We, we certainly hear political neutrality and in elections, you know, we're not going to embrace anybody. Um, but I think that the church has been burned before by, I don't think I know, by people who were associated with the Burt Society and then later on some of Cleon Skousen's groups using the church, um, meeting houses even, firesides, even sacrament meeting where they would promote their right-wing extremism. And the Brotherhood, of course, have been clamping down on that since the 60s, all the way into the 70s and into the 80s. So they're very careful about people politicizing LDS meeting houses, and they want to give the impression that the church is for everybody, not just for people of a certain political party. Well, it's a fascinating era. I think we're going to have to wrap it up there. But um, such a great bit of history for us to learn about and learn about how it affects us as Latter-day Saints today. And I think we're still seeing the, you know, the, the ripple effect from as far back as the 1950s and 60s and with Elder Benson, even today, and we're still navigating that uh, as Latter-day Saints. So, Matt Harris, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us. Yeah, it was a pleasure, Jeff and Jared. I enjoyed talking with you guys. Real pleasure. Um, everybody, everybody, we want to remind you that listeners right now, if they, you can go to the uh, University of Illinois Press, we'll have a link for this book on our website. If you can go there, you can use the promo code MORMON30, that's the word Mormon, the number 30, all one word, uh, on the website and get 30% off and free shipping of Thunder from the Right. I think that's a worthwhile endeavor for any of you. Uh, Jared, thank you very much too, my friend. My pleasure. And you can find us at thisweekinmormons.com, Facebook, Twitter, all that jazz. If you haven't subscribed, please do. And uh, we appreciate you all taking the time to listen in. For Jared, for Matt, I'm Jeff. And be well, be holy, and be happy. Bye-bye.